Good morning. Oh, yeah, it's still good morning. Um, we uh, get back together to uh, go to a panel conversation after that uh, amazing conversation with uh, Sir Mick Davis. We now know do not socialize with Sir Mick Jagger. That was uh, insight I had. I've always wondered how these British uh, high society do things, but I now know that. This conversation is down to uh, ground again. We are going to talk uh, very specifically about uh, how issues uh, impact on our uh, um, uh, industry. And uh, I want you to participate, firstly, with a poll I'm going to put to you now. And then I also want you to please participate by sending through your questions. At the end of this session that uh, will be chaired by uh, Nolita Fakude, um, we will then have 15 minutes to put your questions uh, to the panel. Um, you can nominate who you want to put your question to, or you can just put a generic question and we'll uh, put it to the panel. Um, this is, a, this is a, a difficult topic, perhaps not, um, and even uh, Sir Mick Davis um, referred to it. And this is really the, the issue of, um, of ESG. I mean, some people still say ESG, what is that? What is this new acronym? And yet companies are already taking strategic decisions to sell assets because of the influence of ESG funding and uh, money. So the poll question I uh, want to put to you um, is, 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 is a negative one, but I think it is also trying to just deal with uh, some of the things with we as an industry Perhaps, as Sir Mick says, we as an industry are not guilty of it, but certainly some companies in the industry are guilty of these things. So my poll question to the audience, which uh, you panel people can't uh, participate in, is which industry failure or disaster caused you the most distress or embarrassment recently? So let's not pretend that we're not an industry with uh, failures and disasters. So answer one, the Stalings Dam failures like Brumadino, Answer two is cultural site destructions like Yukon Gorge in uh, Australia. Answer three, mine uh, development despite community objections like Tsukolobeni. Answer four, executive, excessive executive remuneration. Answer five, mine safety or lack of mine safety. So that poll will be up uh, for 60-odd uh, seconds for the slower participants to get to wake up and participate. Um, Nolita, we've got uh, typically today well over 200 industry uh, participants listening in. I uh, expect that this is a highly, uh, um, uh, well, it's a panel I certainly have looked forward to because every board uh, that I sit on, suddenly we talk about ESG, and in some cases we still wonder exactly what does it mean. So uh, over to you and your panel of uh, experts to unpack this for us, and I'll see you at the end uh, for some uh, Q&A. Thank you, Nolita. Over to you. Thank you, Bernard, and good morning, and also good morning to my colleagues on the panel, as well as others who have um, plugged in onto this platform. Uh, Bernard, I like your ethos of candid constructive engagements uh, because surely this should be the one session a year that we are allowed to be kind of normal uh, within a context where we know that we're talking uh, amongst friends. I must say that the presentation uh, in the session with Sam Mick was really in inspiring and also a good setup for this particular session that we are having. Certainly, I have heard people also talk about the S in the, sus in the ESD is standing for sustainability, whereas it is, is standing for social. And it just goes to show you how far we still need to go in this topic. But when say, uh, Mick was talking earlier on 
I did also realize that some of us, certainly for myself, 30 years ago, when I started in industry, the talk was more around profits, people, and planet, the three Ps. And today the talk is about ESG, environment, social, and governance. And as we look towards 2030, and looking at the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals 2030, uh, definitely these are much more broader because today you've got 17 goals, which are all encompassing. And I'm hoping that our panelists today will also cover some of those issues as part of their responses. Certainly, it, in terms of 2020, ESG is probably the topic of the year especially with COVID-19 having exposed the inequalities in societies globally. We do know that the appetite from society to accept the status quo has changed, and also the sense of agency and concern from society and investors is intensifying. When you think about it, after COVID-19, the Black Lives Matter movement was the second biggest headline for 2020. And it's no wonder that various boards globally are talking about these issues and also the expectations are getting more aligned around issues of human rights and climate change, amongst others. Within this context, then how can we as leaders in mining and in the mining sector make sure that we integrate this within our corporate strategies, the climate change issues, the culture and heritage issues, governance gap that we see and lessons learned in the process, as well as making sure that we have the right culture in the organizations to lead the industry and also those organizations. Our panelists for today, are more than competent to help us explore these issues and more. Uh, we've got Peter Davy, as well as Deshne Naidu, Robin Bolton, and Claire McMaster. Welcome and thank you again for being part of this panel. To start off, I will start with Deshne and Peter, just to make sure that we cover the first bucket, which is around corporate strategy. Deshne, what have you seen uh, in the last five years as being the key focus areas and what are the drivers of this in terms of the strategy? Thank you, uh, Nalita, and good morning uh, to everyone. Uh, Nalita, the tone and the narrative from the top of the uh, companies are definitely changing. I mean, when you hear CEOs and chairpersons talk, they're using words like social value, purpose, societal impact, social capital. And I do believe a lot of them are very authentic about it. ESG is increasingly being seen as a source of value creation amongst the mining um, companies. You know, a strong ESG strategy, as we are seeing, has various benefits, uh, be it, you know, higher employee attractiveness to the Gen Zs and the millennials that we're trying to attract, higher profitability, improved risk uh, management, lower cost of capital, influence on investors, and higher market valuation. And that is why it's becoming a core. You know, companies need to right now uh, co-create or co-develop with, you know, the entire stakeholder ecosystem, a more robust framework that covers ESG more holistically. And I think, and that's the key. You know, ESG is not new. The discrete parts is what we've seen in mining over the decades. What's new right now is the increasing focus. And when I spoke about, you know, how the narrative is changing, but what is driving that? What's driving the change in narrative today is that the definition of a successful business is changing. Businesses need to be more inclusive to a broader stakeholder group and be able to respond to changing societal values sooner or more quicker, right? There's an increase in care, as you've mentioned, uh, Nolita, not only for climate change, decarbonization, loss of biodiversity, but also for the widening social and health 
inequalities. You know, organizations are now having to adapt, as Bernard mentioned, sitting on boards, et cetera, to how does ESG now become core to the corporate strategy? And they're also trying to figure out, you know, how do companies now become hardwired in terms of having that executive sponsorship at the top and making sure that KPIs and actions, more deliberate ones at that, are being, um, are being better um, inculcated within organization uh, cultures. And, you know, maybe the last point to mention here, uh, Nalita, you know, you've mentioned COVID-19. Now, there are various factors that are coming um, together for mining in this, in this area. Uh, and maybe in one case, they're not, not just coming together, but coming to a head. And we spoke about risk exposures, um, et cetera. So I happened to see uh, results per survey that was done a couple of months ago. Uh, 3,200 people uh, surveyed across the world. And I was quite stark to see that 70% of those respondents said that, you know, they are now more aware uh, than before about, you know, before COVID-19, that human activity, you know, threatens the climate and that, you know, uh, environmental degradation can threaten uh, humans. So there's a lot of factors coming together. Uh, I think we understand why the push and why the pull right now and what companies are doing or need to do more of in terms of responding around corporate strategy. Thank you, Nolita. Thank you very much, Deshni. Uh, I then move on to you, Peter. You are an experienced director in various companies serving as a non-executive director. Are you seeing any alignment between management and the board and investors' aspirations when it comes to the ESG strategy? And also, what are the shifts that you have seen come through in your own experience? Thank you, uh, Narita. <clears throat> um, I think ESG is n it's not new to the mining industry. I don't think, I know. I mean, last year we had all, you know, Larry Fink from BlackRock. Uh, we had 181 CEOs of the Washington Business Roundtable, and they suddenly announced the purpose of a corporation is not about profits, it's for the benefit of all stakeholders sort of highlights to me very clearly that the industry has been a leader in ESG. We might have had S for social, sustainability rather than social, but it's underpinned the impact strategy for at least 10 years. Um, when we decided to change our vision statement from provide superior returns to shareholder to share, replace shareholder with stakeholder, to be more holistic. So that was 10 years ago, long before the rest of these corporates. I mean, as we heard yesterday, I mean, the S, it's about people uh, rather than about sustainability. You know, mining generally, it's labor intensive in South Africa uh, and many other parts of Africa. It usually occurs in undeveloped countries or undeveloped areas of the country. So mining has always been involved with the social. We may not have, as Mick Davis said, we may not have told our story properly, but we've always been there providing hospitals, education, upskilling, as Bristow said yesterday, um, and, and providing housing. So we've always had that. That's been ingrained. The G is ingrained because most of us are listed. And in South Africa, you know, Mervyn King's legacy there, the King Code, has had all our reporting sort of focused on the G. Um, but I suppose more recently, boards have really started to focus more and more on the E, our impact on the environment. I mean, we're an extractive industry, so we're always going to harm the planet in some way. And it's up to us to mitigate that harm as best we can. Um, and, and look at the minerals we're producing. As Mick says, you know, the planet can't do without the minerals. And I think especially the PGMs, when they provide so much uh, uh, good in the world in terms of cleaning the air from transportation and uh, you know, your, your cancer drugs that all have uh, platinoids.
in with them. So, you know, it's, it's been with us for a long time. As Mick says, we just don't tell the story well enough. Thanks, Peter. And are you seeing more alignment between the management's uh, actions and the board's uh, direction in this process, including the investors? I know the investors, like you say, we've started hearing more from them, but internally, what are you seeing? I think we're, we're more in line than the, we would care to admit. I mean, it, in my view, the, uh, um, the compliance has always been seen as an expense. Um, and I think we're now seeing that the, the compliance uh, to create a more meaningful in society a societal and economic value from it, uh, uh, there is a benefit, a benefit for all stakeholders, not just our employees and host communities, but for the shareholders as well. So I think, you know, there is the alliance there. Um, and you can see that in the, um, uh, what you're seeing is the ESG investor roadshows that are being prioritized across the, uh, the industry now. Um, again, it's been part of part of uh, uh, our culture. We just haven't been good marketers. Thank you, thank you, Peter. Now I'm moving on to Robin and to Claire. And again, if um, what we are hearing, and uh, not that if, but knowing what we're hearing that. Uh, ESG is not new for the sector and the industry. Uh, Robin, in terms of governance and climate change, uh, what are we seeing and how are we doing, especially from your perspective uh, in the company that you represent? Here we go. Thanks, Nolifa. Hi, everyone. So in terms of, um, you know, what, what I'm seeing in my own particular industry and, uh, you know, the nature of the work that I do, I cover quite a few different industries. Yes, extractives, but as well as some other uh, um, sectors. So yes, the sort of the dirty, the risky, as well as, as other sectors. And, and there's a range of maturity that I'm seeing in, in this ESG space from those that have have dates are not available, it's not centralized, it's, it's difficult to obtain data related to ESG so that they can, you know, see how they're performing. To industries that have embraced this for, for, for decades and to the extent they're on sort of round two and three of looking at specific systems and ways to uh, really extract value out of the data that they're gathering and being pretty precise in in what they want to see out of that data and, uh, and, and how they want to report that data. So yes, the nature of the work I'm doing, I've, I've seen a real spread. And, um, and, and just to reiterate, yes, I believe the mining sector is pretty mature in the space. And as, as a general organization, yes, you get certain perhaps companies who, who are not. Um, and, 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 and recently quite a rapid improvement in, in embracing ESG. But just to also add on to the, the one point I mentioned is that I really do think companies must move from seeing this ESG as just a, a reporting exercise and data gathering exercise to, to extracting value out of it. it. You know, those components are there for good reason. They, uh, they, can, add a, they can add value to the company. They can make a company resilient. It, um, so, so from personally, I'd really like to to see that shift from just an exercise to, right, you know, these are important metrics we're getting and that we, uh, we've got to use this moving forward. Thank, thank you, Robin. Uh, Claire, from your perspective, uh, I mean, as an industry, we are good with setting targets. And, and again, the question around mitigation how are we mitigating as an industry in terms of the risks that are there? And is there a balance in terms of the target setting and performance? Uh, this for you, Claire, and also Robin as well. Thank you. Thanks, Melissa, and, and morning to everybody. 
So absolutely, I think what we have to acknowledge is that not all ESG risks are created equal. Um, every organization is obviously looking at their particular risk register, they're looking at the environment that they operate in, and then um, sort of aligning their strategic plans with those particular risks. So that's that's the first thing to understand is that, you know, I think we talk about ESG in quite sort of broad brush strokes, but it's quite specific to the, the different mine or the different uh, mining company, and that, that's got to be recognized. What we are also um, seeing is, is a very good um, mitigation. I think, Peter, you touched on it to say that we, over the time, have made sure that our boards are um, diverse enough to tackle the, the issues, the ESG um, challenges that are sitting on their plates. We've um, you know, seen boards and executive teams driving the right kind of thinking around ESG challenges, ensuring that um, the cascading of the strategic intent that's then come out of your, your risk register is cascaded through, through the business. And we're also seeing very strong programs in terms of uh, corporate value systems and making sure that those values live and breathe within the different organizations that um, operate in our industry. I um, have quite a personal belief that you can build instinct in people. So, um, and you know, it's my HR background, but I believe that as environmental factors change around us, we have a different approach to how we tackle them. And when we share our corporate values and we communicate on, a, on an ongoing basis, we help the people who work for our organizations know instinctively how to make the right call. So if um, there is a community-based or a health and safety-based challenge that sits in front of everybody in our organization, it's a lot easier to make the right decision around that challenge if we understand what the values of our organization are. So I think boards are driving that very effectively, particularly in South Africa. And a lot of that has to do with our board composition. You know, um, in one of the sort of international disasters that, or a sort of really disastrous impact that, that we've seen occur in communities outside of South Africa, we've seen that country calling for directors who understand the environment in which they, they operate. And in South Africa, we have boards that, that represent the communities that we work in. And often the individuals who sit on our boards have grown up in those communities, therefore they understand the challenges. Mm -hmm. And I think so that, that's a key um, strategic uh, sort of move to ensure that, that your board is, has the proper comp um, sort of composition. And then, one of the other areas that, I, that I've seen working quite nicely is how we are applying technology to um, counter our, our ESG risks. And certainly in, in our business, we have a system called Taurus. And what that does is it looks at operational and, and technical data on a daily and a, a monthly basis that's updated. And it allows anybody who's impacted by um, movements on a tailings dam and, and any sort of stability change in a, in a tailings dam facility to have access to that um, program, that dashboard, uh, you know, on their computer at any given time. And that allows, that transparency allows peace of mind for um, our board members, for our executives, and anybody who's then responsible for the ESG risk that's, that's associated with that. So I think we, we are thinking very cleverly about these things in our industry. Also, another example is we have um, automatic weather stations that monitor rainfall, uh, heat changes, and we're using that data that comes out of the, those systems to be able to change our SOPs for our staff on the ground to therefore work in a, a much more um, enjoyable and, and an environment that doesn't actually have a, a detrimental impact on them. So I think, you know, it starts with our board, it starts with our policies, our procedures, how we build um, values in, in our organizations, how we cascade that to the rest of uh, everybody who works there. And then, um, you know, taking advantage of some of the technical, logical, you know, um, sort of uh, things that we have at our, our um, fingertips to be able to, to counter that. It works very well. Okay, thanks, Claire. I, I, I would like Robin to come in and then later also Deshne and Peter, because I think this is really at the heart of this conversation. Mm -hmm. If we do have all these uh, frameworks and targets and boards sitting in and board committees, 
how come do we still see some slip ups uh, in all these uh, lessons for us? So we do need to understand so that we can make sure that we put in place the right interventions. Robin, uh, from your side, please. Yeah, certainly. So, so again, to, to sort of piggyback on a couple of points that have already been mentioned. So, so certainly there has to be a policy and culture that's driven from the, from the top. Um, there need to be the right resources available and the right budgets need to be available. And um, people need to be educated and there's training that's needed around this. There's, uh, there's a lot of awareness that, that needs to be put in place. And I agree there is a space for technology to play in, in, in this to ensure that Know, commitments and, and these risks are managed. And um, I, I, again, I'll repeat, I always think that the right data must be gathered and considered by the right people for the right decisions to be made. So it's, again, it's presenting the right information to those decision makers. Um, and, we, and we've got to move away from this thinking of compliance to, to getting this value out of, of, of the data. Um, Again, to, to sort of repeat some of the points, you know, there must be re repercussions if, if certain KPIs are not achieved or certain breaches take place. Um, and, and also, you know, to the extent maybe there are incentives linked to, to, to ESG performance. So, so these are just some of the ideas where we can try and better culture of understanding this acronym. You know, at the end of the day, it's just integrated risk, really. So, so what are these risks? You know, how can we embed that culture into our organization? And, you know, there's the sort of the carrot and the stick, perhaps, concept in, in ensuring that uh, we understand this. Thanks, Robin. Deshni, uh, thanks for coming. Thank you, um, Nalita. I think you've raised a very important point there. I mean, if we, if we think we're doing a good job and if we think that there's always been elements of ESG within mining over uh, decades, you know, why, do, why are we faced with, with what I believe is the next biggest trend in this uh, industry in terms of increased ESG uh, focus. I think we must ask ourselves a very hard and very relevant and tough question. We are not doing well enough. Um, you know, there might be elements where it has worked well, but what we are not fully appreciating as a mining industry that does by nature destroy the environment and have an impact on the people uh, around the mine sites that it operates in is, you know, the fact that we are running out of time. So what's changed right now and something that we have to address is the baseline of the impact that mines are having. So what we thought all of these years is definitely not what is happening now and we need to respond faster, okay? Simply put, you know, the planet is running out of time Mines, as we all know, as we've heard over the last day and a bit, that this world still needs the metals to be sustainable that the mining companies produce, but that it has to come with a decarbonized, eventually a decarbonized economy. It has to come with, uh, with mining companies that care more about the uh, climate and that are doing their parts in the Paris Agreement. It also comes with mining companies understanding that it's no longer acceptable, you know, to have these loose kind of, um, you know, voluntary policies that you get judged by, that if a mining company wants to truly be accounted for at the table, that you have to be doing more to make sure that you play a part in making sure that the metals that are mined are given to, given to society in a far more responsible way. So, you know, we can have this conversation that there are pockets of good work, but what we're not addressing is that the baseline of what we were measuring ourselves on is now exceeded. The planet does not have the time, and it is up to us to be responsible enough now and admit that. And if we are not going to be regulated fast enough, then maybe the opportunity now is for us to self-regulate to once and for all come up with the principles, the initiatives, what the KPI should be, and finally then entrench this into the organization so that we can not only manage companies to make sure that ESG is priority, but that we are giving third parties enough data to scrutinize us to make sure that we are in fact 
delivering on our promises, which let's be honest, it's something the mining industry has not been doing as effectively for the past few decades. Wow, Peter, Deshne has just uh, thrown in the gauntlet and says, and says that we have not done enough. And I thought I heard you say earlier on that we've been doing this for a long time. What are your views? Where, where is the disconnect here? Now, I realize that uh, Deshne was uh, throwing me that curve ball there. Um, but uh, yeah. The industry is not perfect. There are, uh, um, let's say, those that lead and, and those that follow. I think it's fair to say the industry constantly is trying to work better, trying to anticipate, trying to respond. So if you take those recent disasters in Brazil with the tailings down, I mean, South Africa had its own Mary spread back in the early 1990s. Um, what did South African industry do at the time? It, it went back, looked a lot of introspection, and they now have the world-class sort of tailings dams. You know, we're telling the rest of the world how to build tailings dam. You know, the industry is fairly good. I won't say perfect, because uh, it will just uh, raise the hairs on the back of Deshne's neck. But, uh, you know, it, it's it's good at sharing um, the the lessons, um, and I think we yeah you know, we are constantly trying to do better. Yeah, you know, no one's perfect. As I said, we know we harm the planet, um, but it's how to work better. Uh, and I think what what Destiny sort of uh, was alluding to. I mean, it all comes down to the culture in the organisation. Um, I think you know we need to get to a point where the culture of the organization is such that you know you've got to lead from the top down and those at the bottom are going to feel that leadership um, but it's like walking into a bathroom and seeing the tap left running are you the person that goes over and turns that tap off or do you walk away if you've turned it off you've made a saving you know, you you're cutting down the wastage and yeah, you know, that just goes to show that the ESG has a financial benefit. And once all the mining, once the mining industry sort of grasps that, and and you know, changing a culture is not easy, especially when the industry is spread across the world, different cultures. But it's getting everyone in the organisation to understand that you know it's a shared responsibility. It's not just the leaders, it's everybody in the organization, yeah, going and turning that tap off. Well, thank you, Peter. Uh, Robin and, and Claire, even Deshni, if Greta Thunberg heard us talk about agreeing that we do uh, harm the planet, I think she would also like to know with the next generation what it is that we are committing to do and differently and also how are we planning as an industry and sector to use technology and all the also other innovations to make sure that we mitigate the impacts on the planet um any thoughts from your side and also what are you seeing as as part of that process uh, Nalita, um you asked the question earlier about scorecards and um, and the, the goals that have been set in organizations. And I think it's quite important to, to stress that what are we doing um, is that baseline and that we'd have to we have future plans as, a, as an industry. But if we all look at our lived experience, we know that we have a very good social impact and a very positive social impact on the communities that, that we operate in. So I think we have to start by sharing that with Greta and um, you know the various different um, sort of uh, activists that view mining in a certain light. And even as you said earlier, our, our Gen Zs and um, diverse groups of people who we want to attract into our industry to come and work in our industry. So we've got to get a lot better at sharing what it is that we're actually doing. I mean, if we look back on, on COVID, I'm sure everybody on this call and everybody sitting in, in the audience at Zendaba 
is as impressed as I am about our response to COVID and how the mining industry was able to mitigate the social impacts of COVID um, in the communities that, that we operate. So I think we have to start there and we have to share what we're doing. Then we have to look at and say, how are we driving behavior? We know that um, in mining, over 50% of mining organizations actually have ESG metrics in their scorecard, right? And once again, the devil's in the detail. We need to look at the specific detail of what we've, we've put into our scorecard. So that other um, disaster that I referred to, they had very good um, environmental metrics and very good um, health and safety metrics, but they hadn't actually looked at the community metric and therefore that's where um, the disaster occurred. So we, we look at that, the, that that detail, we make sure that we're putting our scorecards together properly, right? That drives, drives behavior and then cascades behavior to, to the rest of the organization. So I think we have to share that and we have to make sure that everybody is aware of, of that impact and then also almost invite a skill set to be a part of the change. So if Greta and her generation um, want to be part of the, the improvement that, that we can see in mining, Come and work in our industry, help us develop the technology, help us to develop those big data systems that will allow us to um, contain our impact. And I think that's that's quite, quite important. And certainly uh, we are also seeing quite a nice link between executive pay and um, scorecards. So we mean business, I think. We really do intend to contain our ESG impact. And the executive pay discussion is quite a, a lengthy one. And, I'm sure we'll, we'll get into that later, but I think it is actually an invitation to say, well, how are you going to, to add value to, to mining and, and help us contain that impact that we have on our planet in the future? Thanks, Claire. Rob, in your thoughts, please. Yeah, just, just a little bit to add to that. I mean, I don't think ESG should be seen as a, dis, a disruptor at all. Um, I mean, I fully understand businesses must continue they must they must run as businesses and, and be and be sustainable um, but ESG you know it, it must make organizations more resilient lessen the impact on the environment and improve their social performance so just to add about you know ESG must be embraced it must not be seen as a, a, dis, a disruptor and the second point I just wanted to elaborate on we've talked about scorecards and metrics my position and, and uh, what I'm seeing in the industry is actually the, the whole ESG metrics and the standards and frameworks is in a bit of turmoil at the moment. There's so many different standards. You can understand why companies get fatigued regarding you know, what do we report on, why do we report on the same question several times. So th there's a lot happening in this space um, to the extent that I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to stick my head up and say, you know, perhaps mining needs to almost create their own set of ESG standards that, you know, yes, maybe the, the World Economic Forum and, and mining companies and, and mining organizations subscribe to, but it, it's difficult out there for some big organizations to understand, you know, what is it, what are these metrics that we really got to um, report on, you know, why, what's the value they bring? bring. So that, I think to me this shows the, the immaturity of the ESG space. I know we touched on that, but I think we've got a long way to go to get all these ESG metrics sorted out. Thanks, thanks, Robin. Um, and you, you're touching on the point of different uh, reporting frameworks and, and the inconsistency in terms of what or how we report on. Is there a role to be played by the various uh, mining councils that we have and, and the business associations to help create those frameworks locally and internationally? And if so, how do we make sure that again, all members of these associations uh, get the capacity that is required to, to make sure that they report properly and also go beyond uh, the box taking exercise? Um, Deshni and, and Peter, if you would like to comment on that, please. Mm. Thank you, um, Nalisa. So I think Robin touched on an important point there where they, you know, there's so many policies out there. And I think and that's been part of the problem, that a lot of these policies have guided and a lot of mining companies have almost treated it as a bit of a shopping list and decided, you know, what was a pet 
project that they wanted to focus on less and more. So I think as part of this, and you know, you touching on an important point is, you know, what is it and what do we need to do? So, you know, before we recreate anything, I think there's a lot of good work out there for us as a mining industry to take from. You know, the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, are a perfect place to start. You know, with that, the UNGC. And, you know, more recently, and we've seen that, you know, the ICMM have actually refreshed some of their mining uh, principles. You know, that should be the starting point. But, you know, coming back to what we said about, I think Claire mentioned it, that it does depend on where an organization is right now in terms of either ambition levels or maturity or where they need the most impact to then go back and decide against what is there and what good looks like, what roadmap should they then uh, develop. So I think that is where it becomes bespoke. But Nolita, in terms of the point that you raised, I think it's something that we've not, as a South African mining industry, had enough conversation on you know, there is absolutely opportunity for us to take from what works and what is good out there and develop, you know, the South African mining industry standard best practice of what good ESG should look like and what we should then, um, then follow. And, you know, if you want anything to work, you then have to make sure that the KPIs are strong and they're right and that you have the mechanisms in place to monitor and track mining companies against it to your point, I think that the Mundus Council of South Africa can play a very key role there. I mean, we've picked on in the Mundus Council on every other hot topic right now, you know, from regulatory uh, certainty, the good work that the industry has done, you know, to uh, business for uh, South Africa, uh, to the good work that we've done on women in mining. I think ESG and having a CEO forum, as an example, to set up what good ESG looks like and how we should monitor it is absolutely something the industry needs to do uh, more of. But coming back to the point of, you know, the Greta uh, Thunbergs and the conversation that we should be having, I think, you know, something Peter touched on, as an industry, we've just been too subjective um, and almost victims a, a little bit to being told what to do and then to react to it. You know, be it from NGOs, be it now through investors that are very well-meaning, by the way, because I like the fact that the, my, that the money is now finally talking and that's what's putting the pressure on, um, on mining companies. And I think this is an opportunity for the mining companies to actually lead this from the front and take control and be a lot more proactive. So what I think what I would be calling for in the industry right now is the collective ownership of what good ESG looks like. And instead of waiting for the third party scrutiny, we should set them up. You know, we should be a lot more transparent using data, Robin, to make sure that we can demonstrate that we are in fact doing what we said we would do. And by the way, we are third party or independent party, you know, audit ready at any time to make sure that we are on the front foot of this. And I think, and that's what the opportunity is right now. Define ESG, get the experts within the organization and within the industry to find for ourselves what good looks like and give the world something tangible to measure us against. Thanks, Daphne. And Peter, from your side, please. I'm just conscious of the time here, which we're running out of very quickly, but um, not to go over any old ground there. One, one thing that um, strikes me that is going to drive all industries and especially mining uh, is probably coming out of Europe at the moment. You know, they, in, they've got a, a climate change directive which is poised to come entrenched into the financial sector, which is going to be driving the banks and the investment or the fund management industry. And they will need to show that their criteria for lending money, investing in companies, um, is, is going to include an assessment on the company or project's sustainable contribution or alignment to meaningfully contributing towards that net carbon uh, target for 2050. Now, there are going to be incentivizations in there for the financial industry to sort of help direct the mining industry um, especially, but others as well, um, in terms of uh, you know, discounts on their interest rates, et cetera. So that 
that I think was supposed to kick off in 2021, but it probably been delayed by COVID. But I think you know, coming out of a block like Europe, that's going to change a lot of people's thinking. Um, but again, coming back to, I think we, we're we sort of ahead of the curve. A lot of the rating agencies coming in now are you know, just formalizing what we've been doing a lot of the time. Um, and I think our, the industry's response to COVID-19, I think is testament to you know, where we put uh, uh, the, our social responsibility. Um, it's there, it's prioritized at the board level, at the ex executive management level, and hopefully it's being felt down at the bottom of the organization. That and Lipita, you are right. The, the decisions that have been made by the industry and the boards over the years have been felt in, in the various um, stakeholders, and we, 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 we definitely need to do more. Uh, I'm seeing Bernard come through, and I do know that uh, it's important that we remain resolute around this topic and also vigilant, because again, in the next 10 years, we need to make sure that we've got the right building blocks um, and also build on the successes that we have had. And it's good to see what we have achieved as an industry uh, in South Africa during COVID-19 is presented because clearly we are able to collaborate appropriately where required and also share the lessons uh, amongst each other. Yeah. Am I? Are yeah. you ending? Back? Are you ending back to me? You yielding some of your time to me, Madam Chair? No, I, mean, I, I kept on seeing you pop up, and I wasn't sure because I thought my panelists also had one minute each to close down and wrap up. Why don't you do that? Do that. Yeah. Now. Thank I'm you very much. So I will start with uh, Robin and Claire and then Peter as well as Deshni in that order. One minute, please. Your closing remarks in terms of what we as leaders can do in the culture that we need to put in place to make sure that this happens. Thank yeah, you, Robin. Thank you. So, you know, to, um, to avoid just repeating some of the great points that we, we've made, I just want to add a little bit more about understanding ESG risks. So it's one thing to kind of get a strategy and plan in place, but again, it's about understanding those risks. So with, with the talk of climate change, for example, I mean, there's a lot of physical risks we've got to be aware of. There's a lot of transitional risks that companies need to be aware of. So, you know, to understand ESG is to understand the details such as, you know, what risks are we exposed to? What do we need to manage? and how do we address all those risks. And then lastly, just probably to add, yes, the mining doesn't necessarily have a very good reputation, so we do have to address ways to sell our story better and, and improve the sort of reputation of the business. And here's a great enabler. ESG is a great chance for the industry to, to grasp it, to perform well like we did in the COVID response, and to prove that you know, the industry is, is, is serious about this. Thanks. Thank you, Robin. Claire, please. Your last comments. Thanks. So absolutely, I think um, I agree with, with Robin. ESG is our, our chance to shine and our chance as a, an industry to show the, the rest of the world and other industries what, what we're made of. I do think that we have to watch that link between executive pay and um, actual delivery in terms of um, ESG metrics that get included and also the percentage of executive pay that gets allocated to the, those metrics and also the long-term effects of ESG. So we're seeing malice and clawback being included in, um, in executive pay and various other, you know, when executives actually leave organizations that they can still um, come in and return some of their bonuses to, to the organization. So I think that's a very important debate that, that we need to keep our eye on. And I just want to make one final point that like with the, the COVID crisis, we learned that we're all in this together, whether we are mining houses, uh, suppliers, or um, communities. And I think that when it comes to every aspect of ESG, we need to remember this and um, always look at our suppliers as mining houses and make sure that we are partnering with people who share our, our values and share our 
view on ESG management. Thank you very much, uh, Claire. Uh, over to you, Peter, please. Thank you, Maritha. Um, so my, my minute is culture is ultimately our shared experience. And who wouldn't want to work for a compassionate, responsible industry that ultimately strives to make South Africa and the world a better place? I mean, the building blocks of that culture are pride, pride in our business, pride in our country. And that comes from shared respect, shared responsibility. ESG has got to transcend politics, class, wealth. And it needs to be global, not just in the developed world as a priority. Um, and the industry, as we've heard time and time again, needs to tell its story better and with pride. And COVID-19, as, as we've heard mentioned many times, is, is something that has just brought us, or business, the industry, the government, and the communities, I think, closer together. Let's hope we can build on that further. Thank you very much, Pizza. Uh, Deshni, please. Yeah, I'll be quick. So I said that the definition of successful or the definition of businesses in terms of success is changing. So I believe successful businesses going forward will be those that meet the needs of as many people as possible, utilizes as few resources as possible, and engages with and are responsive to as many of their stakeholders as possible. We do that. We get it right. I think my last comment is that we are running out of time and we need to accelerate the response to ESG and that can only come from bold leadership, ambitious targets and deep transformation. Thank you. Thank you, Deshni. And uh, thanks to the panelists. Uh, certainly, Bernard and colleagues, we are all humbled to be part of an industry that has got huge potential to impact society, not only in terms of the products that we provide, but also in terms of our financial contributions to various uh, GDPs. And thank you very much for giving us this opportunity. Over to you, Bernard. Thank you, Nolita and panel. Um, I want to um get uh, 240 people online to uh, engage with a yes or no poll. Mick Davis um, uh, indicated on the topic of ESG that his own experiences, when you throw money, not throw, when you spend money and time on an area, you often get productivity benefits, things happen better, we do it better, and therefore it doesn't automatically cost more. So my question to our audience is, um, and it's deliberately a question that, that you can answer yes or no to. I, I'm making the statement that ESG is go, going to cost mining companies a lot more. That's my statement, and I would like to see how our audience respond to that. So is ESG going to cost us a lot more, yes or no? At the start of this uh, session, I asked a question um, that I will give you the response to as soon as I can find it on my phone because I'm an old man with two hands and four um, thumbs. We asked them, um, which industry failure disaster caused you the most distress or embarrassment recently? Um, and 33% of the people said the uh, failings dam failures uh, in Brazil. 23% thought the cultural site destructions in Australia. I'm quite surprised that only 13% of the people think the mine development issues around Solobeni and uh, northern KwaZulu Natal is embarrassing. There's still a good 20% of people who think executive remuneration continues to undermine um, the uh, industry sort of uh, perspective. So whilst we um, get people to participate on the poll, I want to come to the specific questions, um, and quite a few, um, and Claire, I think you put your people up to it, quite a few questions related to executive remuneration and the linkages to executive remuneration. Peter, I'm going to ask you, as a non-executive director, can you look the shareholders in the eye and say there's a link between executive remuneration and ESG factors? 
Is it there yet? Is it emerging? What are your views on that? Is it there yet? Um, it's started to come in, Bernard. Um, it's it's creeping in. I think it needs uh, to be uh, a little bit more heavily formalised. I mean, when you come to executive remuneration, if you take Impala, I think the Gini coefficient for our chief exec is 0.27, way below where the South African, rest of the South African industry is. So I think yeah, we're, we're sort of trying to do the best we can there. Um, but yeah, it, it needs to come into the uh, remuneration KPIs and not just at the CEO level, obviously down through the, the executive. Good. Um, anybody else, uh, Claire? I mean, you 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 uh, raised it as a as a link that you want to see. Um, would you agree that uh, there's more to be done there? More specifics as per your original input? Absolutely. There, there's a lot more work to be done, but I do think we're moving in in the right direction. And I mean, I've reviewed a, a couple of uh, reports, integrated reports of our large mining houses. And A, we're reporting on it for starters, and I think that's you know that transparency is very, very important. And then that linkage between the ESG metrics and executive remuneration is being um, put in place and then is being measured. And I think more and more will, will become a, a part of other mining houses um, executive rem approach. And then I, I do also think though what's going to be interesting in 2020 is that a lot of uh, organizations haven't actually achieved their, their goals for the year. So financially, mm -hmm. they've had a tough time. So I think what's, what's going to be tough for our REMCOs is there's going to be quite a lot of discretion that comes into play around the financial metrics, and that might dial up what are, are previously known as soft metrics for ESG. So I, I think it's a, a bit of a watch the space for 2020 and see what gets reported in, in the following year. Mm. And those, are, <coughs> those questions came from uh, um, both uh, Scott Williams and uh, Hope uh, Tyra asked around executive uh, remuneration linkages and so on. There's also a question from Hope um, about uh, do we have the correct mix of qualifications and experience at the board level to correctly direct companies in complying with ESG sustainability issues? Um, so, Destiny, I'm going to ask you, and then uh, Madam Chair, if I can ask you as an experienced board director to also comment, uh, Nolita. So, Destiny, are we, I mean, this is a diversity question. This is exactly what, you know, what we should be doing. Are we doing it? And then, uh, Nolita, if you don't mind commenting. Yeah. So, uh, Bernard. Before I comment on the board um, composition, I just want to talk about the exec rem. I mean, very quickly, I think we're doing well on the on the LTIs, so long term, but we're definitely not doing well on the short term um, incentives, and that's the move we need to see uh, to get executives as well as boards more focused on the uh, short term uh, incentive side. And that's kind of linked to the next question in terms of you know capability and diversity at a board level and then at an executive level to drive this. And I think, you know, simply, we probably have people that care, but I don't think we have people with the right qualifications. And where is the qualifications on sustainability? So I think this is going to cast another lens on selection criteria for boards, is that you need to re-look at qualifications in terms of sustainability. And I mean, I'm just going to be controversial and throw something out there. We know that in the past, you know, roles, what we used to term previously, the softer roles, HSC, HR, et cetera, used to go to people that really didn't fit in other places in the organization. And so if we are now committing or recommitting to this, I suggest that we do make sure that we've got better criteria or qualification-wise for sustainability on boards, and that is cascaded into executives. I actually read a Russell Reynolds uh, uh, report in preparation for this, Bernard, because we take it very seriously. <laughs> and the data showed us that they are, for, uh, a, a, a fact across the world, I, I won't go into all of the uh, details, but sustainability criteria is not something that boards use to recruit uh, members. Thank you. And Nolita. Thank you, Bernard. I, I think what I'd like to add around the issue of board composition 
is the fact that uh, to just have one or two non-executive directors on your board uh, just to say I've got diversity doesn't cut it because we do know that uh, it's important that you have at least some critical mass and visibility in terms of your diversity on your board. So whether it's gender or race or any other issues under ESG. So we do need to see more diverse board members on those boards. Secondly, we do know that the board dynamics, like in any other environment, also are influenced by uh, who has the loudest voice and often that voice coming from the investor side and how it is manifested on the boardroom table. And therefore it's important that even as we appoint non-executive directors on these boards, we make sure that it's people who can really exercise the voice that they have on that board rather than want just to be comfortably part of the board and not uh, challenge the status quo. So it's got to be around the culture of the people you bring in and also the leadership of the board chairperson to make sure that they encourage uh, a robust discussion around the table and also make sure that the dissenting voice and also the people who are different uh, do get listened to and ahead on these boards. Uh, that, that's my view and, and my experience. Thank you. So, Nolita, that means one thing only, and that is that it can only be women who chair boards in future. Um, otherwise, none of those objectives of yours will be achieved. I want to quickly, and we are so quickly running out of time, um, so 64% of this audience thinks that ESG is going to cost us more. I'm not even too worried about it. I don't agree, but if it costs more, it has to cost more because we can't leave a negative impact uh, in this sort of space. Um, but Robin, so we, de we, deal, we deal with the board um, and uh, the, these are areas of, of expertise and you represent such an area of expertise. Are you optimistic that the uh, mining industry is going to find the uh, money and the time to get serious about this? Um, and very briefly, because I'm going to have a uh, a time ticker counting us down soon. Robin? Yeah, sure. Um, well, we can't wait. We've got to change. And, um, you know, just to come back to your point about it's costing more, I really would like to see a shift to people saying, this is going to create value for me. Even if it costs more time, it must create value. And, and I think we will start seeing that. You know, maybe an upfront cost, but the value is down the line. And there's a business for that. Um, it's been reported many times. Mm. Now, I am going to, Nolita, um, say I am aware that you've been very involved with the uh, Minerals Council's uh, gender program. Um, but surely gender issues is a social issue still and still belongs in ESG. And this is the problem with this bucket. It gets so wide that there are so many things. So final comments from you on the uh, um, just the the gender issues that also sits in this bucket. Um, and I may have to interrupt you at the end to uh, wrap it up. Thank you. Uh, gender diversity, like any other diversity and inclusion issue, definitely belongs to ESG. And we have to think about diversity and inclusion as being a part of normal way of being uh, in any organization. And it's very, very exciting that the Minerals Council of South Africa, at least after 18 years of having women being allowed since 1997 to come onto the mines, have now also made sure that the CEOs are going to champion the whole issue of, with, of women in leadership within the council. So thank you very much, Bernard. And uh, obviously, I addressed that question to Desni and Sainolita. So, Desni, you've got 30 seconds to also share your views on this. Both my friends are going to be cross with me for this mistake. I do apologize. <laughs> Desni, um, yeah. 30 second response. Um, Bernard, we've seen the data that more diverse companies, gender diverse as that, does contribute to the bottom line. It is a no brainer that if South African mining industry is the backbone of this economy, we need women to get more involved so they can add the value so that this industry 
does become the go-to industry in terms of the COVID recovery, as well as then what this country can then thrive on. Very simply, what we try to do with the Minerals Council is make sure that in the first instance, women diversity is increased, that we get the numbers up, it's and that all of this... Sorry, and the CEO's there's, not second, there's not going to be a second instance. You summed it up. ESG and inclusion is a no-brainer. I thank you all. Thank you so much.